Drizzly <laughs> dark gray afternoon here in the collapse of everything in the fall of 2024. Good Lord. Uh, where are we? It is Tuesday. Uh, September 24, 2024, and I'm sitting here in my little cage, my little cage at Bugs in a Jar Farm, thinking about what to rant about today. So guys, I was going to read this long uh, essay on the subject of zoocosis, my new word of the day. And I am going to start out reading, I'm, going to, I'm just going to read the opening of this, and then we're going to go over, the reason I'm not going to dedicate a full rant to it is because this fellow Dave Pollard, who I just read from, I feel like in the past week, has come up with one of the great essays. You can decide what it has to do about the collapse of everything. I'm really hoping you can make it to the very last paragraph of uh, Dave Pollard's essay and you will get the tie-in to this one. But let's read the opening few paragraphs by some woman. I think I might have read this woman from Medium.com uh, titled... Do humans have zoocosis, a hypothesis on our mental health crisis? So I guess uh, she is from San Diego. <clears throat> My hometown is famous for its animals. For the excited tourist or overworked local struggling to afford the astronomical rent, the San Diego Zoo is an oasis from everyday city life. Just pass under that wide awning with its friendly cartoon lion and you enter another world packed with delightful creatures from anacondas to zebras. If you look more closely at the animals, you might notice something strange. Big cats pacing in circles for hours, zebras biting repeatedly at things that are not food, elephants rocking their heads back and forth, back and forth as if hypnotized. All these animals so far from home in some sort of deep distress written in their bodies. Have a couple of exits up I-5 and you will hit another famous San Diego landmark, SeaWorld, that family-friendly water park now rendered infamous by the 2013 documentary Blackfish. Between their performances, marine mammals are often kept in small enclosures, cut off from their natural communities and culture, driving them to repetitive, self-harming, and hyper-aggressive behaviors. For 18 years, delighted visitors to SeaWorld San Diego could watch Obi the Walrus regurgitate and then swallow his food, press himself against the glass of his tank, alone and blind in his captive world. Like many animals in captivity, Obi the walrus likely suffered from what is often called zoocosis. Zoocosis is the name given to a condition observed in animals in captivity characterized by stereotypes, not stereotypes, stereotypes 
or repetitive behaviors that serve no apparent purpose. Common zoocotic behaviors include head rolling, repetitive pacing or swimming, regurgitating and re-ingesting food, repetitive gnawing or pushing against enclosed bars, extreme self-grooming to the point of self-harm and self-mutilation. Animals in captivity also often display hyper-aggression towards both humans and other animals. Animals that evolved to roam large swaths of territory and grow socialized in kin groups tend often to respond poorly to being isolated from their natural communities and kept in small enclosures with strangers under the constant stress of being watched from all sides. And of course, what Anna Mercury is doing in this piece is a long lead up uh, talking about the similarities between animals uh, in captivity suffering from zoocosis and uh, what humans, what we all are. We are a bunch of captive animals cut off from our kin communities and our natural environment suffering from zoocosis, or I guess we could say human kosis. But anyway, uh, anyway, she takes that and goes on a long tear. And I was going to read that, but then I stumbled across Dave Pollard's uh, latest contribution to How to Save the World. And even though I just read from Dave very recently, this is one of the great essays that have come across, you know, as a former editor uh, who has spent years editing other people's copy when I come across something this magnificent. Uh, I just have to share it. You can decide for yourself what this has to do with uh, the collapse of everything or zoocosis, which you will have to wait till the very end. So hopefully my battery won't collapse till I get to the dots connecting this essay to the one I just read from. But uh, Dave Pollard, an amen brother, uh, his uh, treatise on is this talking about loneliness or not, titled This Alone, What We Pay Attention To. Take it away, Dave Pollard, with one of the great essays that I have read in a while. <clears throat> so, this body is walking around the neighborhood, apparently, taking advantage of the fact that its long bout with plantar fasciitis seems to be mostly ended. This self remains a hostage to this body, which does what it does irrespective of what this self reasons to be the most appropriate course of action, leaving this self with nothing to do but rationalize what was done. And this self remains also a perpetual hostage of its feeble and hopelessly flawed internal model of reality. Reality, of course, being in quotes. The prosthetic veil through which it unhappily views and judges everything. With such a handicap, it is amazing that the human species has endured as long as it has without killing itself off. At least that is what this self tells itself now. So then uh, <laughs> Dave is going to walk through his neighborhood and visit a local cafe.
Two teenagers cuddle on the sofa in the cafe, half draped across each other. Their eyes dart back and forth between their screens and each other's eyes. Their faces are animated, passionate. They hold on to each other almost desperately. It's at least one hand constantly in touch with the other's body. They speak, but the words they say are incoherent. They don't have to make sense. The tone, the touch, the expression is all that matters. Of course, nothing about this is conscious. The chemicals in their bodies are compelling this conditioned behavior exactly as they drive the mating behaviors of all wild creatures, exactly as they condition and drive all of our behaviors. The objective of this particular evolved conditioning, it would seem is to make the couple oblivious to everything except the task at hand, the business of procreation. And then if that task succeeds, the chemical mix will shift to compel parenting behaviors. They could not choose to do otherwise any more than they could choose not to breathe. Well, obviously, I chose, millions of people have chosen not to uh, become parents, but uh, I know kind of what he's talking about. Thank God it did not apply to me. They think they know each other and are known by each other in that unprecedented way conveyed by our most anthemic love songs. But there is no knowing another person. They are each, as we all are, always utterly alone and utterly unknown. The guys half hidden in the bushes on the windowless, doorless side of the supermarket, the part where stuff is stored between shelving or shooting, or shooting up or ingesting street drugs. They are looking out for each other, kind of, casting furtive glances out towards the street before returning to the task at hand. One of them is crouched over, gently rocking. One of the others is fiddling with what looks like a kind of torch. The third guy looks over toward me, where I, when I keep walking, he turns away, sits down under one of the bushes. The people walking by, giving them a wide berth, are just like me, going around the corner to the supermarket entrance, driven by the same chemical conditioning to harvest what is needed to survive and feel good as the men in the bushes. It seems the only difference between, between us are the circumstances that have led up to our respective conditioned behaviors. We judge, we make sense, we think we know what is going on and why it is going on and that we have some control over what is going on. But we know and control nothing each body is just acting out its conditioning. Each brain is furiously rationalizing that condition as its decision 
when it is not. Apparently, that is all our big, much vaunted human brains can do. As I look out the window of the cafe, a couple pushing a baby carriage stops to chat with someone sitting at an outside table. Coming up the side street, a woman pushing another baby carriage stopped as she gets near the intersection to do something on her cell phone. For a long moment, the two carriages sit almost face to face, their tiny passengers staring at each other with astonished looks. Their attention is riveted on each other. There is some evidence that babies, like wild creatures, have no sense of themselves as separate beings and no sense of anything else as being a separate thing either. That does not mean that babies and non-human animals cannot learn conditioned behaviors that enable them to respond very effectively and instinctively to their situation and environments. They have no need for selves and no need to make sense of things. The babies look at each other as they might look at wild creatures and as young wild creatures might look at them and at each other. With conditioned curiosity, an evolutionarily advantageous learning tool, what is that thing? Let me feel, touch, sniff, explore it. Bring it closer. There is a young man sitting in the corner of the cafe. He has headphones on and nods occasionally, most likely participating in a webinar. His hands are positioned so they cannot be seen on the screen's camera and he is folding paper into different shapes. First he produces a paper boat, then taking longer, he carefully constructs a paper airplane, taking pains to make the folds crisp and precise. A few minutes later, the webinar apparently over, he puts his two constructions on the windowsill beside him, packs up, and leaves the cafe. A few moments after that, a woman with a young boy in tow comes into the cafe. They sit at the table next to where the paper constructor was sitting. The woman goes to the counter to place her order. The boy looks around, spots the paper constructions on the windowsill, and stares around the room. He then races over to the windowsill and picks up the paper airplane. He looks at it for a moment and then choosing its destination, an unoccupied table, four tables away across the room, carefully launches it. It glides perfectly and several people turn as they see it whizzing past them, landing faultlessly on the unoccupied table. The boy, seeing it land, quickly sits and puts his head on the table, hiding his face. And then suddenly there is a little round of applause and from some of the cafe customers. The boy glances up in surprise and sees several people looking at him. He jumps up, bows, and sits down again. His mother, her back turned to the action, returns to the table looking at him with a frown on her face and says, what was that all about? The boy shrugs. A moment later, a departing customer picks up the airplane and with a wink, quietly hands it back to the boy. And that would be, of course, Dave being that customer. Outside, a small dog, a small dog is taking its people for a walk. The dog is paying attention to everything, 
sniffing, staring, darting sideways at the slightest noise or disturbance. It's people, like most of the people walking along the street, are not paying much attention to anything. Some of the people on the street are talking on phones or looking at tiny screens or chatting with each other, not watching what is coming towards them, largely oblivious to upcoming curbs and other obstacles. Other people on the street are walking more quickly, looking straight ahead with that, I know where I'm going expression. It's as if they are willing themselves not to be here at all, to jump forward to their destination and skip the annoyance and exposure of the journey. The 20 or 30 something guys wearing two 20 or 30 something guys wearing dark sunglasses amble along the street together walking deliberately slowly, taking up much of the sidewalk, they have that practiced, I am somebody strut. They are paying attention, but only to being paid attention to. Unlike the fast walkers, they want to be noticed, but they also want to appear to want to they also want to not appear to want to be noticed. It is all street theater, especially when they are nearly run over by a woman staring at her cell phone, disrupting all of their performances. Two young teenage women, teenage women walk by them all they are toting shopping bags, and one of them wearing a very short, loose skirt has her hand firmly smoothing and holding the hem of the skirt down as they walk. Perhaps like all of us, it seems she's not sure what she wants and whether and by whom she wants to be noticed. One of the guys in the sunglasses still recovering from the collision with the distracted woman, pivots involuntarily when he catches sight of the teenager in the short skirt, nearly causing another collision. He looks annoyed. His cover is totally blown. John Green, I guess a writer, John Green drawing on Amy Rosenthal's work wrote that so much of our worldview and the course of our lives is determined by what we pay attention to. He said by what we choose to pay attention to, but of course we have no choice. Even if we unsubscribe or turn off the screen, that is as much conditioned behavior as moaning at our personalized doom scroll. Everything we do and believe is conditioned by others' behavior, so in that sense, John is exactly right. The others that we are exposed to face to face or in our viewing and reading and listening condition us to hence determine what we subsequently think and believe and do. In a world of social bubbles, few of us are exposed to or ever pay attention to people who live or think much differently from how we have been conditioned to live and think. Even worse, they are entrained to dismiss those others who say or do anything or are even alleged to have done something that we 
disagree with, or do not understand. Even when we are exposed to them, we do not pay attention to them. They must be wrong, misled, stupid, evil, or insane. Scroll past, change the channel, walk away. The little dog knows better. It knows everything is wondrous, interesting, worth paying attention to. You can see how much this dog uh, loves paying attention to everything that his person says. That This dog is a master of attention. Obviously, Dave has never met Sancho Panza. Yes, for most of its life, for most of its life, it is not clamoring for attention from others. Obviously, Dave Pollard does not either own a dog or certainly does not own uh, Sancho Panza. Uh, now that he's gotten the attention to get in my lap, he doesn't have to pay attention to anything else. He has gotten what he wanted Unlike we humans with our cell phones and sunglasses and carefully chosen clothing, yes, it is not the center. The little dog is not the center of its own universe. <laughs> uh, Dave, uh, would you mind uh, coming, watching Sancho Panza uh, for a while? Two kids, probably on their way home from high school, judging from their outfits, stop into the cafe for iced lattes. The boy reaches into his backpack and draws out a small, stuffy plush toy, which he presents a bit awkwardly to the girl. Her reaction is nothing short of a swoon. She covers her mouth in delight. She laughs and smiles and hugs him. When he goes to place their order, she pins it to her, to her pack and takes dozens of selfies of herself with her new gift and the pack. She looks so happy. My new adopted community is very multicultural, but there are a few things that many of these cultures seem to have in common that are not part of what might be called established Canadian culture. One is an almost exaggerated, but absolutely genuine politeness to strangers. I would now never think of not acknowledging my co-passengers in our apartment building's elevator and wishing them a good day as each arrives at their floor. But a second is the important ritual of bringing gifts to any occasion, no matter how informal. The gifts are mostly simple and, and hand, often handmade and elegantly but not ostentatiously wrapped. There are entire separate rituals that govern how these gifts are presented and how they are accepted. Partial hint, give and receive gifts with both hands. Gift giving is an absolutely lovely custom, and I'm hoping it rubs off on the rest of us. Such a simple way to say that we can never hear too often, I see you, I appreciate you, this is for you. I walk toward the lake, and in the park I just stop and sit and look around. It is so easy not to notice, to turn one's attention inward instead and live inside one's head. Too often it feels safer too and more reassuring. No one gives us their complete attention the way we give it to ourselves. 
and then in the last two paragraphs, Dave Pollard goes off in, into absolute la-la land. I, I knew something had to be coming, and here we go. This is where you need to remember zoocosis. As I watch the people and the more than human creatures in the cafe, on the streets, in the park, I am struck by how humans, thanks to our meddling selves, process our aloneness different from other animals seem to. Only for us, I think, is there ever a sense of being lonely. Other creatures are social, of course, and are conditioned to enjoy and may depend heavily on the company of their tribe. They may even justifiably fear being isolated from their tribe, but I think they are connected to all life on the planet and are integrally a part of their home ecosystems in a way that humans have forgotten. You cannot be lonely when you're always connected to and part of everything else. We humans can only console our fragile, disconnected, befuddled selves with the knowledge that these selves actually have it all wrong. In truth, there is no one to be alone. Yes, if we could only see past this false, separating veil of the self and pay attention to what is outside, I suppose that would be obvious. And I like this response from Kavana Tree Bresson. I really enjoy reading your stories of neighborhood walks. Out one persistent thing I disagree with though, the idea that only humans are lonely or feel grief. An orca whale named Talaqua mourned her calf's death for 17 days. Asian elephants loudly mourn and bury their dead calves, according to this article. Even my cat, who is an excellent communicator, clearly wants me in the room when he eats. And uh, I think Sancho Panza would amend that. Clearly, he wants to be in the room when I eat. Anyway, speaking of that, I think it is time for your dinner for your uh, factory farms chicken and rice. But uh, up until those last two unadulterated horseshit uh, paragraphs, I want to thank uh, Dave Pollard for that otherwise excellent essay about you figure out what that has to do with the state of uh, this civilization and this planet. But I do think Dave needs to read. I'm gonna I'm gonna send Dave the link to uh, whatever that was called, zoocosis, and maybe he can pull his head out of his ass if, if he thinks uh, humans are, are, are the only uh, animals on this planet who can feel alone in life. All right, little dog, let's leave our little cage and go get your dinner while we still can. Bye, guys.